So using a ray of speakers these day, and it's really, really exciting to have them on board. Uh, first is Dr. Sarah Venturini. She's currently just finished her academic foundation post at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, following an impressive track record from her time as a medical student. Sarah will be starting as a neurosurgical trainee at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. She was a previous member of the research team at the International Student Surgical Network and is a member of the NIH. Pascali Gallo, who is a current uh, consultant and adult pediatric nearest at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Um, he's also an honorary clinical senior lecturer um, at the University of Edinburgh, sorry, as well. Uh, he's completed a pediatric neurosurgery children's hospital and has active interest in surgical practice and pediatric neurosurgery. I think she is in the phone, that's why. <laughs> yeah, Mickey, I think we lost your audio there. Hello? Yes, I'm in there. I'm sorry, Makina, I don't think we can hear you. I think the connection has dropped or... Um... Hello? Hello? Hello, Makina. We can't hear you very well. I don't think we can hear. So should we just get the, should everyone just introduce themselves? Is that probably yeah, easier? Might be better. And we can get started with questions because there's a few questions coming through already. Go for it. So I think my thing could be heard, so I guess um, hello everyone, and I'll just let everyone else introduce themselves who've not, um, I don't think you've heard who they are. Yes, we can fake. Uh, Dr. Alalade, do you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so my name is Andrew Alalade. I'm a consultant in the area of testing um, up in the next year. Andrew, we can hear you, but I think your volume is a bit low. Go again. So my name is Andrew Alalade, um, and I'm a consultant Andrew, if you can just quickly uh, take out the um, your headphones and use your computer's microphone, that would be much easier. Let's just try that. It's slightly better, yep. Yeah, so I'll just introduce myself again. My name is Andrew Alalade. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon um, at the Royal Testing Hospital and top specialty for days on neurovascular.
Okay. Um, Just go on. I don't know what that is. Shall we start? Yeah, I think we should just start. There's a lot of questions coming through, so should we just get started? Well, fire, with fire with the first question. Let's start, and then yeah. hopefully we resolve the the problem and the issues on the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I think I'm just going back to the chat. I can see on the side, mm. and um, the first question that um, uh, somebody called Mohammed asked, and uh, they had a couple of questions. So one thing was uh, what. Uh, things that medical students interested in neurosurgery could do, um, including clinical placement and research audits. Um, should we start with that? Um, and then the next question following that, which I guess would be more for you probably, would be what is a general day in the like of your work like at the moment? I'll answer the second. You go with the Yeah. Okay, as you're very fresh now. Congratulations <laughs> for your recent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just I'll get started with the first question. Um, which kind of is a nice summary, I guess, to be to get started on. Um, I assume all the people in on the on involved in the session here um, might be interested in um, neurosurgery, so this is quite a good thing to start on. Um, I think there isn't the main thing to say is that there isn't really one thing only that you could do. Um, I think if you think you might have an interest, um, the first thing would be to you know be proactive and try and seek out opportunities to see if it's actually what you want to do. Um, and that can be a very, a very number of things. Um, in terms of clinical placements, it's very important to try and shadow and go and observe um, neurosurgery. And this is not just in the operating rooms, but also um, on the wards in clinic to see if you enjoy the whole range of neurosurgical practice. Um, some students might be lucky, they might have neurosurgery placements in medical school. It's not very common, um, but if you do make the most of them, um, and also make the most of all placements around it. So other surgical placements will teach you very good skills. Um, if you have neurology placements, they will also teach you very good skill. Um, and if you don't have any specific placements, to reach out to your local departments. Um, everyone is usually very welcome into having students around. Um, it doesn't matter that you haven't had experience before. I think just, you know, ask, um, write a nice email or just stop by the offices and say, you know, I'm interested, could I come and um, shadow the department for a day? Could I come to surgery for a day? Um, and then if you enjoy it, I would say carry on and try to get a longer placement. Um, this can be difficult because not all medical schools are attached to neurosurgery hospitals, um, in which case you might you might need to be a bit more proactive and try to reach out to departments in nearby hospitals. Um, but I, I would say the best thing to do is, you know, be proactive and keep asking. Um, don't be scared if, you know, um, if you want to have an interest, I think it's important for you to try it out. It's the only way to know if it's really what you want to end up doing. Um, and so I would say even from early on, um, you know, go and explore it and see if it's what you like and would like to do. Um, and then later on, if you think you've, you know, it's really what you want to do, there's opportunities at the end of medical school to complete things like electives, um, which can take you all over the world. Um, they can be clinical, they, being, they can be research focused um, and try to really make the most of those kind of free opportunities and free times that you have. Um, and so that's more the clinical side of things. Um, and you know, in, in how you can get experience. Um, the other thing to say is that actually it's really important, it's really, really important to be proactive in all your clinical placements because you need to learn the basic skills. You need to, you know, show interest and become a good general junior doctor first. So it's not just about showing interest in your neurosurgery placement, but it's also about learning in all the other um, placements that you have. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question that I think was about research and audits, um, again, um, people are normally very happy to have medical students involved in small projects and audits. Um, and to do that, it's mainly on you to try and ask and be proactive and get yourself uh, sort of involved in things. Um, I think one of the main things is, you know, not to um, not to expect things to be handed to you on a silver plate. You need to show that you are interested um, and you can start from something small. Um, and once you show that you can, you know, um, complete your projects and you can get involved, then more opportunities will come your way um, following that. Um, so I think my main piece of advice would be to really try and get stuck in, try to use the time you have um, to see if it's really what you want to do, because, you know, sometimes you might think it's something that it's not, and you might actually try it out and see maybe you want to do something different. Um, 
and that's okay. It's not a wrong decision. It's just, um, it just needs, you, you just need time to ex experience it, I would say. Um, Thanks, Sarah. That's okay. I approve all you said, yeah. <laughs> all true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the true. perfect student um, should do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to jump on the second yeah, question? A lot, just a lot, to and give people a bit of an idea. Is, uh, volume is a bit better, and you, uh, how is it now? Hello, can you hear me now? Now, now, you see? Sorry. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. I, I, I think it's because I'm in the hospital. The hospital yeah. Wi-Fi is not the best. So I've had to log yeah. in with my phone. Um, follow up yeah. to, I didn't really catch Sarah's questions, but from what she said, I'm going to try and figure it out. I think it's, you know, the attributes needed if you want to try and get into neurosurgery. Um, mm -hmm. Like Pascal said, she's highlighted the main points. Um, commitment specialty is quite important. Nowadays, things, you, you look at the CVs of um, people who applied 10, 15 years ago, things have changed and things have evolved quite a lot. It's become quite competitive. Um, it's quite ideal to have at least some foretaste of what you'll be getting into. So as a medical student, try and aim to at least have some, you know, observership, some stint, Getting a mentor is quite important. So getting someone who's gone ahead of you, um, I wouldn't advise you to get into, um, you know, neurosurgery or even apply without at least speaking to someone who's um, treaded the path. So try and speak to more senior colleagues. They love helpful people. Uh, my time, you had to maybe email or send letters. Nowadays, you can reach out to everybody Twitter. on Twitter, <laughs> on LinkedIn, you know, phone calls. People are so accessible now. So try and get people to mentor you, get advice, um, and speak to people who've applied. Get, um, you know, like the, what, what do they call it? The Orion, is it the application thing? Yeah, speak to, Oreo. Yeah, the Oreo. Speak to people who've applied um, and three, four years ahead, um, go through it, try and work out what is needed. Nowadays, many medical associations, including the GMC, CANMED, are looking for a well-rounded 21st century doctor. It's not just being a surgeon. It's all about being a health advocate, being a professional, someone with lateral thinking. So all those things, you have to try and demonstrate them in your CV, in your portfolio, a leader. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So get yourself ahead of the pack. Thank you. Thanks. Andrew. Should we go to the other okay. question, Sarah? Sorry? Should we go to the, what was the? Yeah, let's move on to the next question. We can always come, I think there's more questions coming through about what students can do. So why don't you give an idea of what a day in the life of yeah. a consultant neurosurgeon is like, and then we can go okay, back. Okay, let's say that what you said, and then you said, it's all true, and the guy's already in. <laughs> I'll tell you what I would really have appreciated they would have told me when I start before I started yeah. neurosurgery yeah. 15 years ago. So um, obviously a typical day depends if you're a registrar and consultant, they are quite different, so obviously different roles and they can be quite different. Um, first of all, let's make clear the majority of your day is not surgical day. You don't stay in theater 24 hours, seven. I mean, this is a wrong idea. It's even less than 50%, I would say, if you're fortunate. Surgery is the pinnacle of your journey. But being a neurosurgeon, like being a doctor, but particularly being a surgeon, is not just about doing the surgery. Actually, the most important part comes before and after the surgical procedure. So uh, a typical day may start, for example, in the morning, you may have uh, uh, some sort of meeting. Um, I make an example with my typical schedule. For example, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon as well, and I do 50-50 at the moment. So I make, if I'm, I, I'm in the sick kids hospital, for example, on a, a Monday morning, I'll go eight o'clock to a neuro-oncology meeting where we discuss patient, pediatric patient that need a, an operation or patient that have been operated for a brain tumor or a spinal cord tumor or any kind of CNS tumor. And we take shared decision with other professionals. This should highlight you how important is the team in a modern healthcare system, you know? So you should be able to engage with other professionals, to agree and disagree, 
in a decent manner and try to learn mutually from other professionals as well. Then after an half an hour, an hour meeting, you go, you start the word round perhaps, which may take another 45 minutes uh, or an hour according to the number of patients you have obviously to see. And, and then strongly depends if on that day you have your theater commitments or not. If you don't have theater commitments, maybe you will be busy with admin, for example. You may receive like 70, uh, at least in my case, 70, 80 emails per day. So you, you're quite busy actually with your admin and you may be very busy also to, you know, look at the um, mail and, uh, and the other letters that you receive from uh, uh, your secretary and other colleagues, check up on patients that you already operated in the past, making sure the patient had the right uh, uh, scan book, uh, check results, and so on. And this may take two hours of your day, maybe two, three hours. And uh, instead, if you are in theater, obviously you go to theater and you dedicate your day to theater. Or um, if you are on call, obviously, you may be busy with the on call. Um, and in my case, if you have to dedicate some spare time to medical students, like in my case, to fourth and fifth years medical students, for example, on a Friday, I, uh, we run tutorials to the medical students of the Edinburgh University. So uh, usually it's a two hours, an hour, two hours tutorial about general neurosurgical topics. Because as Sarah rightly said, we're trying to introduce neurosurgery as a mandatory uh, topic into the medical formation because it's, it's I mean it's quite important um, to have alongside neurology. So this is pretty much my week. If you like, in theory, you may have a day off, but as a consultant, but not always you're able to take it actually. <laughs> a registrar day may be a bit much more busy, uh, and uh, actually you need to know that at the moment. There are a lot of issues with the European working directive in being registrar because we cannot figure out a way on how to work properly a registrar and at the same time respect the European rights working directive. It's very difficult, especially in Italy. This is a problem that we need to address in the next few years. I think the European directive should be revisited and uh, in order to make a proper training because at least when I when I was registrar probably also and you I mean there were no European directive we were able to manage with our mentor and professor and supervising the right amount of time and we're still alive so it's feasible <laughs> so but this is a big problem in many units nowadays as Andrew can, yeah. can probably confirm if they have registrar in, in the hospital yeah. Yeah. Andrew do you have a lot to add to um, yeah, so my typical day or week, um, usually we have a handover um, around 8 o'clock every day. Um, so the on-call registrar, um, the registrars, what we do is we do a kind of 12-hour shift for the registrar. So there's someone overnight. So we gather in the registrar room, well, now virtually um, because of COVID. So we um, gather in the registrar room. We go through all the overnight cases. Um, we have the neuroradiology team um, join us. And Pascal, um, you know, um, alluded to something similar where there's, there's a multidisciplinary approach now for many things. So we get the neuroradiology um, team to join, um, neuroradiology team to join us as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then we pretty much, we have um, about three, four theaters running um, for elective cases. And we discuss the cases and we plan on how we're going to operate on the emergencies because usually overnight there would at least be a couple of emergency cases coming. After that, we break up into kind of red and blue teams um, and the registrars do ward rounds. So we have certain days where all the consultants will join um, the ward rounds. Um, after that, so I do skull-based pituitary and vascular. So it, it means pretty much through the week, um, usually joining um, either of those MDTs. So we have Scorby's MDT, we have pituitary MDT, we have cerebrovascular MDT. So you have radiologists, sometimes you have pathologists, you have oncologists. We join um, those meetings and we discuss cases. You learn a lot from those meetings, uh, many times interesting cases, um, 
and there is a certain reassurance in having your colleagues agree on a management plan with you. So it's not just you. Um, you, you you're agreeing on a plan with everybody. And sometimes it means, you know, your colleagues will pick up things that you might miss. Okay. So like the radiologist, they have a way of looking at scans. They'll highlight things that you might miss. Um, if I'm operating, then it's pretty much an all day case um, or maybe two, three, four. If it's a really big score based case, then maybe an, uh, just one case. Um, so you'd be in theaters. Um, some other days we'll have clinics, um, usually face-to-face -face clinics. Now with COVID, we're doing a lot of telephone clinics. We're doing video consultations as well. Um, initially, I must say I was a bit skeptical about the idea, but now with a couple of months, I've got so used to it, you find that, that a lot depends on the clinical history. You're able to ask the right questions. Um, and even sometimes you can in a way, examine patients over, you know, a video consultation, um, you know, as long as your, your basics are, are right and well-grounded. Um, and that's it. If you're on call, you go through uh, with the registrar. The registrar comes to tell you if there's some urgent cases that need to be discussed. If they need to go to theater, you go urgently to theater. You should be within 30 minutes. Um, a drive of the hospital as a consultant in case your registrar needs you um, overnight. Um, my, uh, what Pascal has said is very important. As a registrar, life might be busy, but I think the responsibilities and the paperwork increases significantly as a consultant. Um, as a consultant, you're getting so many letters from GPs, patients, your secretaries, your inbox is always full. So you have to go through, you have to reply messages, you've got to dictate letters. Um, so, so pretty much it's, it's, um, it, is, it is a job that you know, requires quite a lot. Um, for registrars, it's a 48-hour rule. But we know with surgery, the more cases you see and the more things you're exposed to, those are the things that make you um, a um, So it's, it's all about striking a good balance um, there are certain numbers at the end of training that you're expected. So far at the moment, I think it's 1,200 in total, and it depends on how you can space that out over your eight-year training program. We also have sessions for journal clubs and teaching as well. Great. Um, that's really good. I'm sure that this was very insightful for people on the panel, uh, sort of attending the session. Um, there's a couple of other questions. I've gone through the side chat. Um, so. There's a few questions that I'm going to try to group together into one. Um, so an, a student asked about intercalation, whether it's worth doing it or not. Somebody else asked how you can maximize your chances of getting into training as a medical student and what to expect at national selection. Um, so I think I could probably try to answer this question all together as one and then maybe pass on. You're, to you, you're the best um, person to answer again. that. You're the best person because you're fresh. So. Yeah, and then after that, there's another question to say, uh, what are the best and the worst things about neurosurgery? So I can pass it on yeah, to we you can and answer. think about it in the meantime, uh, about your answers, okay? Yeah. Um, so I'll get started. So somebody asked, and I'll try to group them together because I think they all go into one kind of same answer. Um, for those of you, I assume most of our attendees are from UK, but there might be international students too, I'm not sure. Um, so for those of you based in the UK, um, intercalation is a year that you can do med. degree in either science or research. Um, and this gives you sort of a different year, um, different experience um, compared to just your medical school training. Um, and somebody asked whether this is essential or required or advised uh, for neurosurgery and whether you should do it in a neurosurgery related topic. Um, I personally intercalated, I took a year out and I did research in medical physics. Um, I was actually doing research in transcranial Doppler ultrasound. Um, so it, it was something kind of related to uh, cerebral hemodynamics and um, sort of brain physics, uh, but it wasn't necessarily clinical neurosurgery as such. Um, wherever you go to medical school, there will be different opportunities to join neuroscience degrees or do something completely different like psychology or more like humanities um, or do um, things like anatomy intercalated degree or just more research focused ones. Um, 
I personally think if you have the opportunity to do it and you feel that you would want to explore something else, um, it's a great idea. Nobody that I know that did intercalate uh, regretted it um, because it gives you a chance to try something different. It's often more self-directed than medical school and you have more time to explore something that you I'm passionate about and get more experience in something that's a little bit different. Um, it also can give you more time to build up your portfolio, build up your CV. You often have longer breaks compared to the academic year of a medical student where you can build in um, placements, um, especially in those medical schools where you don't have neurosurgery placements like mine. I, I didn't have a neurosurgery um, hospital attached to my medical school, so I organized placements in my own time. Um, so I think it gives you a different um, I guess, outlook um, to what it's like to become a doctor, but also perhaps a, cl a clinical academic later on, if that's something you might be interested in. Um, so I think if you, if, you, if you think you might want to intercalate and you have the opportunity to do so, um, you will not regret it. Um, and I think it does add very good skills. It teaches you about um, basic research skills um, and it teaches you about sort of academic medicine um, and something different. Um, it doesn't have to be a neurosurgery related thing at all. Uh, people do all sorts of things and change their mind. I think the skills you learn are very transferable. Um, so I would say if you can and you think you might want to do it. Um, at the same time, it's not an absolute requirement. So if you don't think you would enjoy it, um, if you have, if, if it's not allowed or if there are problems that mean you can't take a year out, um, I wouldn't force it. You can make up your CV and things in other ways. Um, so I think it's a personal choice. And I think either way, um, you can still be a very successful candidate, even if you don't have an integrated degree. Um, so that's kind of the side of things of that. Um, in general, um, as I kind of alluded to, there are many different ways to make yourself a competitive candidate, I think. Um, the worry that um, I have, and everyone is kind of um, affected by it, there's a big tick, there's a big checklist that you look at uh, when you want to, when you apply for neurosurgery, there's a big checklist that says all the things you should be doing um, and all the points you can score. Um, and I think the worry I have is that, is that sometimes when students approach me to ask, you know, advice, um, is that you really focus sometimes too much on just the checklist and ticking all the boxes. Um, because ticking boxes in a way is important. That's how you're scored against everyone else. Um, so you need to make sure that you cover all the broad areas, but you're assessed on very broad areas. So people want to see that you're good at your clinical job, um, that you care about your patients and are a good doctor in general, not just with neurosurgery. Um, people want to see that you're interested in teaching other people, um, so you're involved in education of other medical students. This can be something very general, like maybe medical school, you were involved in peer education um, with a, within your, your know, school, maybe you held uh, some seminars and it could be something unrelated to medicine as well. I have friends in medical school who were doing teaching like basic life supports for sort of, you know, primary school kids and all those things show that you are interested in educating others. Um, other things that people want to see is that you're comfortable and interested in some kind of research. Um, now, I'm, I'm very interested in research, but some of my friends who equally got in are not very passionate about research. But what you need to show is that you know how to do it. You get involved in things that would affect your practice. Um, this can be done through an integrated degree because it gives you more time to focus on bigger projects. But equally, you could do smaller audits, you could do smaller projects together with your clinical teams. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do just one thing, which is the integrated degree on its own. Um, and also you have to show that you're interested in um, improving patient care through getting involved in audits, uh, which are things that you can easily get involved in in your clinical placement as a medical student and also as a foundation doctor. And all these things, obviously, it would help if some of them are related to neurosurgery because it shows commitment to the specialty. It shows that you'll spend time looking at various aspects of what neurosurgery is like, uh, but equally, they don't all have to be neurosurgical. I think, you know, you, you can gain really good skills and really good um, experiences in other things. Um, and people won't judge you harshly for that because we know it's difficult um, to just focus on neurosurgery. And also you should explore other things um, to be sure of your choice. I think one thing that's very important is, you know, you need to keep an open mind, um, even though there's something you think you might like the most, uh, but you can't just have a really narrow minded view and just eliminate everything else um, without even trying it, because you might actually find out that something else is a better fit for you. And if you've kept an open mind and try to get all the skills that you can, then if you end up changing your mind, that's actually much easier than if you just, um, you know, 
didn't allow yourself to explore other options. Um, so I would say, you know, to be um, a sort of to be a competitive candidate, I would say, you know, try to do your best. You need to try and focus on your medical school. Don't forget it. You, you know, all the other things that you need to do are on top of becoming a good medical student and graduating and becoming a good junior doctor. I think that's the one most important thing. You need to become good at your basic duty as a doctor. Um, if you can't do that, the rest doesn't really matter. Um, and then try and build the other things around it, um, but try and focus your interests. I think having the checklist of areas that you need to kind of show um, your skills in is important, but try not to focus too much on just a tick box exercise. Um, you're allowed to follow your interest and you're allowed to um, do things that are maybe not just neurosurgical, but something slightly, slightly different, um, I think. Um, and then the last set of part of the question was uh, what to expect at national selection. Um, somebody said, is it just a panel interview? <laughs> oh, I wish it was. Um, so a national selection is like a half a day um, interview selection process that happens. It's once a year. Um, and this is all UK based. So if some of you are applying or are studying it elsewhere, I'm sorry, this won't really apply. Um, so in the UK, um, all the recruitment for specialties happens once a year. Um, it's a national process, so everyone applies through a centralized system. Um, you all get scored, um, and there's a cutoff, so the number of people that are shortlisted will then be invited to interview. Um, the interview itself, um, as I say, is about half a day. Um, it's more of a station-based interview than just a one panel. Um, and this is done because throughout having different stations and different groups of people interviewing you, you get tested on various aspects uh, and not just not, not just one. Um, the stations that you have cover various things. One is about your, yourself and your portfolio, and that's really the chance that you have to kind of sell yourself and try and show the panel why, you, why you'll be a good trainee and why you want to do this. Um, and that goes back to all the things you've done and you've included in your application. You, you can really build on that and kind of um, try and show your interest. And the other stations um, focus on clinical related things. Um, so in one station, it, you will be given some patient scenarios and you'll have to interpret some um, imaging, some patient findings, um, and you'll be questioned about what you would do next, um, what, um, you know, what's the diagnosis, what the problem would be, what would be the differentials. Um, and this really, I think, is why it's very important to become a good doctor first, because lots of the things you would do are basic things like, you know, assessing your patient, getting the basic investigations done. And these are things that you, you will learn to do across all your placements and across your two years at a foundation trainee, and um, not just in neurosurgery. You need to, you know, be safe and do the initial things first. Um, and then there will be more questions about kind of specific uh, pathologies related to neurosurgery, because the patients you'll be given uh, will have neurosurgical problems. Um, but people expect you to be a good general junior trainee first. Um, then there are some other stations where you're asked to take referrals. Um, so you'll be given a telephone consultation where you'll have to take a referral about um, a neurosurgical problem and give some advice over the phone and uh, decide whether you're going to accept the patient um, and what the next steps would be. Um, for this, um, I think if you can, in your foundation years, try to get a neurosurgery placement. Um, it's very difficult, there aren't very many. Um, and if you don't have it, it's okay. You can always arrange taste weeks in your foundation years um, and try and get experience that way. Um, if you're lucky and you can get a neurosurgery placement, um, the best thing to do is try and you know follow the registrars when they take referrals, um, hold the register bleep, which is the one that gets all the referrals through and try to answer those questions yourself and discuss it with the seniors. Selection. Um, um, on the day. Um, the last thing you want to do is for all of it to be a surprise. Um, I don't think it should be a surprise. You should practice and you should uh, get people to quiz you and get things wrong and that's okay. Um, and just keep, you know, practicing until uh, you're confident with your answers. Um, and then there are some other stations where um, one of the station is about communication. So you are given a patient and an actor, it's kind of like an OSCE for those of you in medical schools um, that interact with uh, simulated patients. Um, and you often there will be um, a diagnosis to describe to them and um, something to discuss, maybe a safety issue, uh, maybe 
um, uh, something, an investigation that was misinterpreted. Um, and you have to show that you can talk to your patients. And again, these are skills that you acquire throughout all your placements and through being a good doctor and speaking to your patients in a way that they understand. Um, so again, this, lots of this learning comes from just your day-to-day -day job. Um, and then um, there's another question more to do with ethics and more to do with kind of managing difficult situations, which again, all of these things, if you focus on becoming, you know, doing your day-to-day -day job well, I think, um, I think that you can, um, you know, learn that way. Um, and then towards the time when it comes to applying, um, then use your seniors, use people that have applied before, use your mentors and um, ask them to practice with you. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a summary of, of the day. Um, I don't know if any of you want to add maybe what, what you would like to see um, in a candidate come into national selection. I, mean, I think you cover most of that, but the main point is what exactly you said about being a good doctor and a mm -hmm. person and a good doctor and a passionate about what you do and someone who is able and aware of the sacrifice as well that implies being a neurosurgeon and working with neurosurgeon. But as a, a friend of mine told me once when I was a very soon, he said, if you do something with passion, even the pains that this profession brings, you know, they won't look, they won't look so bad, you know. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I mean, there are downs in, uh, in the profession. Is, uh, for example, nobody likes working on night, be on call, because it's disruptive. Um, it disrupts your quality of life. I think mean, everyone agrees on that. It's not ideal, but again, that's why it's very important to be passionate about the subject. Otherwise, you will find unbearable to do this job, as many, many of the surgical jobs. Yeah, I agree. And then the ethical part is obviously important. I mean, ethics is something that is coming much more and more and more into our profession. They've always been there, at least since the 70s. But there is such an abuse of the of the medicine on the patient that uh, it's always important to stress the role of uh, being ethical in our profession. Yeah, yeah. I think one just last just one last thing before passing on to you guys and the last question would be um, all these things that we're talking about. You know, all these things to you know try and get involved and get placements, try and get involved in research and audits and teaching, and you know try and really experience neurosurgery and use some of your free time to do it. I think you know all these things shouldn't really be a chore if you start to do it and it feels like you're forcing yourself to do it and you feel that you don't really want to get up in the morning and go to you know assist in theater and if you don't want to get up in the morning and go to clinic and if you don't want to do the research and these things um i would say that maybe that's a sign that it's not really what you want really to be doing um i think you know all these things that we say you should do you know you should want to do um and I think that's very important. I think sometimes people that decide very early on, oh, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon, I'm going to be this um, because it's, you know, what you thought you wanted to do. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, it's hard to have a conversation with yourself that maybe you've changed your mind. Um, and that's OK if you do. Um, but I just think, you know, if, if all these things that you want, you start doing, start feeling like things you have to do and not things that you want to do, um, then that's probably the time to have a, you know, think with yourself and see, you know, is it actually what you want to continue doing absolutely because um just in um in a response to one of the questions that you said earlier about the good and bad parts of neurosurgery yeah is there good parts there are also bad parts um bad parts you would have to break bad news to patients not just patients but family members and that can be very disheartening uh, we've got a pediatric neurosurgeon here with us who would tell you that it's very difficult handling um, you know, family members, especially very worried patients. Um, and even discussing with non-neurosurgical colleagues, because for some reason, some people have seemed to have this morbid fear of something that has to do with the brain. You get a frantic call from your mates in resource, um, everybody's worried about them. There's this large brain bleed. People look up to you to be able to make the logical decision, you know, when everybody's losing their heads, oh, this is what's going to be done. The challenging things with being a neurosurgeon is you've always got to keep a cool head. Um, in theater, for example, you can't lose it in theater. 
the theater nurses are looking up to you, the scrub nurses are looking up to you. Um, it's a very challenging case. You've got to make sure it's right. If there's a complication, it, it, it all comes down to you. Um, so these are all the things that you've got to be able to deal with. Um, making a decision, you know, spot on decision. You're holding the bleep. You've been holding the bleep for hours. You're getting calls from, depending on which science center you're in, um, 10, 20 different hospitals referring to you. Um, you know, you've got to make a quick decision. You've got to balance up, prioritize, um, and be helpful to the people who are referring patients. Look, there are lots of good sides. I can remember my first um, unsupervised case, the one I did sometime in 2009, patient collapsed. Um, and the next morning after operating on her, she was eating, laughing, walking, smiled at me. There's no feeling that beats that, you know, no feeling. Um, I can remember another patient with a brain tumor who was literally blind and the next day she could see, you know, and it, it, it was just so exciting coming back and knowing that, yeah, I've done a seven hour surgery and this patient was happy. This patient was glad, her family were happy. So there are the good sides and the bad sides. And like Sarah said, you have to know what you're getting into. There's no point getting in one or two years down the line and then oh, I shouldn't have done this. This is really scary. This is really annoying. Um, so have, have a to what you're getting yourself into. Again, observership, shadow, some senior colleagues. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Okay. Pasquale, do you have anything to add to, to this? Uh, you said so many true things, you know, that each one of that uh, will require hours of discussion, each for starting yeah. from Andrew. I mean, Andrew put so many, so many important topics there starting from the communication with the parents, but also with colleagues. I mean, we can spend an entire day discussing about the right way of communication and how practically 95% of the complaints and the problems arising from a miscommunication. So mm -hmm. learn how to use the language with your peers, with the parents, first of all, how to communicate news in a you know, compassionate, decent way, and, uh, and always remember, you know, that you have another human being in front of you, always. So that's why the ethical uh, values are very important. They come first before to be a doctor, then you become a doctor, then maybe you become a neuroscientist. And that's and you said, you need to absolutely be aware where you're going into, because we are already full of colleagues that are tired, they're not passionate anymore, and these people, they are a burden for themselves, but also a burden onto the system, you know? And you don't want that. Yeah, um, I agree. And I think, I think you know, all of these things that we say are right, and I think that's why I think the, I think the point that we all really want to stress is, you know, it's good to have an aim and it's, you know, it's important to have an aim and to a goal that you want to work towards. It's, it, it does drive you. And I think it's something important to have, but don't forget all the simple things that sometimes in all this rush to excel in this rush to try and get publications and presentations and all these things, you can forget the really basic things, which are, you know, speak to your patients when you're on placement. It doesn't matter if you're in a respiratory place and then talking to a patient that has bad COPD, talk to them, um, you know, learn what the problems are, learn to, Talk to them about, you know, the fact that they have maybe a terminal prognosis. Like, le you can learn from any interaction in any of your placements. Um, and that's something that, you know, you can't forget. And I think sometimes you worry too much about not having specific um, neurosurgery knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to try it out and it's important to get experience. Point um, for medical students out there. Um, people, if you if you if you commit and if you say okay, I want to be a neurosurgeon, people will have opinions. Um, often, people outside of neurosurgery will have a lot of opinion if they ask you what your career goals are, and they will say, "Oh, neurosurgeon," they'll tell you, you know, things like you're crazy or. Um, and you know, you need to learn to build a bit of a tough skin for that. I think don't let it put you off. Um, 
Um, and that's something important. And that's why it's very important to find yourself good mentors that will support you um, and will guide you through when maybe other people might not sometimes. Um, and it's not to put a negative spin on things. It's just reality. I think people, you know, will tell you their own opinions, which are all valid, but you need to be sure in what you you want to do. Um, finally, Andrew is one of my mentors. Uh, so this is a... Um, a nice panel to kind of uh, join back in. You did a good job, Andrew. I was oh. about to say, oh, you <laughs> 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 Nah, see, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah is a good, is, is a good mentee. One of the best I've come across. <laughs> sure. um, so I think, yeah, you need to believe in yourself, but get people that believe in you and will push you because some people will try to dissuade you from doing what you want to do. Um, there's a question that I think would be maybe a quick one to touch on. I think we're kind of getting to the end of our time, perhaps. Mm. Um, but somebody asked, and this is more for you guys, um, is a family life possible with neurosurgery? Um, I guess it's quite a topical question. Um, do you want to give a quick answer to that? Andrew, do you want to answer first or do you want me to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't mind. Um, family life is, is possible. It is tough. Um, but it is possible. I, for one, I've got, I've got two kids. I've got an 11 and a seven year old. Um, and it's not been the easiest. It's really been tough. Um, and you've got to know what, what you want. You've got to know um, what you can cope with. Um, I think for me, the secret is having a very supportive partner. I don't think I could have done it without my partner. Um, I'll tell you a quick story, two minutes. I can remember a few years ago, I went for um, a course in Cambridge and they were cracking jokes. And um, I think it was Peter Hodge who was cracking the joke and he was saying, oh, I'll give you 20 pounds if you know this. Um, and he said, oh, which specialty? Um, like if you're going to hide a 20 pound note from um, a, where you're going to put it. If you're going to hide it from an autopod, where are you going to put it? And the answer was, you know, either you stick it on the patient or you put it in the notes, you know, you just ingest. And he said, if you're going to hide it from a, from a neurosurgeon, where are you going to put the 20 pound note? And we all guessed nobody knew. And he said, oh, you're going to stick it on their kids because they never really see their kids. And I was so sad after he said it. I was like, oh, my God, I need to be at home more often, you know. So it's, it's all about having, and, and now because of the time, because it's neurosurgery has changed, surgical training has changed. If it was the old days where you're spending 80 plus 100 hours in the hospital, it would be more difficult. But nowadays with the time, as long as you have a good job of balancing it, then you're able to do other things. So it's definitely much better now. And even if you have any problems, you know, reach out to your deanery, reach out to senior colleagues, so it's definitely, it's a way to be. I, Pascal, I your turn. I agree, I agree absolutely with Andrew. I mean, once, this is an old prejudice as the, and uh, it's an old myth, you know, that you cannot have a family, you cannot have a balanced life. I would add, you need to have a balanced life to be a good surgeon. You need to have a healthy lifestyle to be a good surgeon. So your life needs to be a life, you know. You cannot separate the private, professional. And they say, yeah, you, you separate private and professional. But I mean, your life is a whole. You can't just dedicate yourself to the profession and decide not to have a private life because this will affect, in the end, also your profession. And it's true, au contraire, as they say in France. So you need to try to find the balance. And it's absolutely possible. And nowadays you have much more guarantees as well because there are laws in place. And this is particularly true. I mean, improvements are surely needed also for female neurosurgeon. But already the condition of female neurosurgeon nowadays is not the same as 20 years ago. I mean, uh, there are much more opportunity. They know they have rights. They know what they, at least, in, you know, in, the, in, in some countries, at least in the UK. So they know exactly what the rights are and they should pretend their rights to be respected. Because remember, if you don't you know, argue for your rights, nobody's going to do it. So rights are there and you can have a life and you can have a wonderful family. So, and be a good neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. That's good. Somebody asked a very quick question. Is the gender balance in neurosurgery? 
<laughs> not at the moment. Is there, is there what? What did you say? Is the gender balance in your research? Not yet. Somebody asked. Oh, oh not, not yet. Um, last, the last published yeah. figures I'm aware of, um, I know that when the SBNS, because the SBNS has been looking, the SBNS is a Society of British Neurosurgeons, they've been looking actively into this. And about two, three years ago, at the consultant level, females were 8%. Um, at the consultant level, and at training level was 18%. Um, but that was about three years ago. So I think the numbers are gradually trending up. Um, yeah, and there are active, they're active yeah. measures being carried out to try and um, at least implement some balance. So it, it's going to get much better. At least I know a lot of female colleagues now and junior colleagues. So I, I think the numbers are, are improving. Again, I wouldn't focus on the numbers specifically, you know, because numbers reflecting a, a, a past uh, full of prejudice, you know. So things are... Yeah, yeah, at the, at the same time. I mean, I, I know excellent female neurosurgeons. They can have a balanced life nowadays, you know, in several countries, not only in the UK. So, I mean, numbers are not all, and I'm sure in the future you may actually see the other way around. You may see more female neurosurgeons than male neurosurgeons, and... You won't be wrong to say, oh, why there are not enough male neurosurgeons, you know? So it doesn't really matter. It's what about you want to do. It's possible for female neurosurgeons to be great neurosurgeons, be great mothers if they wish, and uh, have a family. So. I would just say, you know, don't let put you off. I think, you know, sometimes, and that's what I was saying, you know, sometimes people will tell you, you know, oh, why do you want to be a neurosurgeon? That's a crazy idea. You're a woman. That's even a crazier idea. Um, you know, it's don't let that put you off. If that's what you want to do, you know, do it. Um, I think it's also wrong to keep, you know, waiting for things to change. You know, if it's something you want to do, you should be part of making it change. Um, you shouldn't just expect that someone else will change things for you. Um, so 